I am so excited to be here. This is an incredible cam. Look, take a look around. This is incredible. When I just when I walked in, I couldn't believe it. I feel, felt like I was at Seabase part of the time. <laughs> felt like I was at the ISS part of the time. This is amazing. So really, a huge round of applause for all of the people that worked on putting this together. A lot of hard work, energy, and love has gone into creating this experience, so enjoy it. Uh, so I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, talking to you about why IPFS matters and why the work that we're doing uh, is important, and not just now, but in the future, meaning th there are a lot of things happening right now in the world that over time will accumulate to something very significant, and those decisions are being made now. Uh, so David and Molly asked me to talk about IPFS from the be beginning, so I figured I would start at the beginning. Let's see. All credit for that goes to Melody Sheep, which is an amazing, who's an amazing artist. Uh, and the reason I like starting this way is because we often forget that we are at the culmination of a very, very long history of the universe becoming aware of the universe producing you uh, and other things. Uh, so, shorting it, uh, it, it's often really useful to look back and to look forward. Um, and so if we look back and we think of not just the last five years or the last 10 years, uh, but we try to really look back at our history uh, and we think about things a million years ago, we can think of the technologies and things that, uh, that shaped us and things that changed uh, from the past. We can think of those shifting and in, you know, by uh, 100,000 years ago, things looked, started to look pretty different. We started to organize in various different ways. Uh, things started picking up speed around 10,000 years ago with different kinds of innovations, and so on. It kept getting crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier. Uh, and so this is an, an incredible um, speed of development, uh, and it's hard to understand where all of this is headed. Uh, if you try to do this towards the future, um, it, this is an exercise in, in futility because it's extremely difficult to predict what is going to happen. But we can try. Uh, well, we can at least look you know, ahead a, a little bit, and we can think of, um, say, hey, we have a lot of automation going on. We have a lot of AR and VR coming, potentially. We have, uh, finally, the space uh, race is back on. Um, and we have uh, a whole bunch of similar kinds of, of innovations that seem tractable. Uh, maybe a little bit further out, we have uh, things like human augmentation and, th and different kinds of machine learning and, and narrow AI that, that is going to uh, augment what we can do. Perhaps we'll start uh, colonizing other planets. Uh, we started getting into like the 100 year mark, and that gets really fuzzy. Uh, will we get nanotech? Will we be able to assemble anything we want? Will we be able to program the genome? Will we, will we be able to create digital um, artificial intelligence? Th this is, these are like the fundamental questions that are going to be uh, decided upon the next uh, roughly 100 years. Uh, and that might set 
humanity and uh, our future in a very, very different, different course. What will happen after that? Will we figure out how to go faster than space travel? Will we make rogue AIs that will be evil, or but from our definition of evil? Uh, or will we make benign things? Or what exactly is going to occur is extremely difficult to predict. So contrast this. We can't, we can't really fathom what's going to happen a thousand years in the future. And yet, the past. Uh, looks very, very uh, understandable to us. We can trace the path of progression. Uh, so the future is very, very uh, uh, nebulous, and it's, it's unclear what's, what will occur. You try to do this further, further ahead, and it's just we cannot at all predict what, what might happen. Maybe we'll create Dyson spheres. Maybe we'll uh, travel to, uh, across the stars. Uh, maybe we'll create von Neumann probes and uh, go off around the galaxy. And you know, a million years is, is completely on. Um, it's completely beyond our reach of, of being able to reason, reason about this at this point in time. Uh, so th this very uh, simple way of compressing uh, our timeline from a million years ago to a million years in the future demonstrates that we're part of something extremely special, uh, something that is occurring right now in here on this planet, um, here in this century, in this moment of, of space time. Uh, it's extremely uh, fundamentally different than the things that have been happening before. Uh, so I want to talk about computing for a moment, and computing and IPFS. Uh, I think the, a lot of people think about computing in terms of the printing press. Uh, they compare computing to the, an invention that managed to create all kinds of knowledge distribution and create um, different notions of um, communication across uh, all different kinds of societies. Uh, and then people are like, well, maybe not. Maybe it's actually more impactful than that. Maybe it's something like writing. Um, writing was actually much more important as an innovation than, than uh, the printing press. The printing press accelerated the distribution of, of writing. Uh, but writing itself gave us culture and, and, and a way to write it down um, and pass it on beyond uh, kind of oral traditions. Uh, before that, uh, hey, maybe language itself. Could computing compare to the invention of language, the ability to uh, create abstractions and communicate them to each other, the ability to learn together? Um, I actually think that these are all off, and that in reality, computing is something as fundamentally important as biology itself. Uh, so we can think of the invention, in a sense, um, the invention by uh, just replicators, uh, that invention of the ability of an, of an organism, of, of something material to start to evolve and to produce the, the wealth of, bi of biodiversity that you see around you, and you, uh, that's the kind of impact that something like bi uh, that kind of an innovation can have. Uh, and so that's how I think we should be thinking about computing, is that level and that scale of an innovation. Uh, in a very short amount of time, uh, computing has gone from uh, just a whole bunch of machines in huge rooms uh, that you had to kind of wire together and like very simple uh, mechanisms, all the way to having supercomputers in your pocket so that you can look all, at all kinds of information and do all kinds of super powerful things. So we, as humans, walk around already as cyborgs. I, I don't think that just because the computer is not physically embedded in you, uh, you can you know, think of yourself as the same as, say, a human being a million years ago. You're fundamentally different. You can do many, many things <clears throat> that your ancestors couldn't. And so that's something that um, we, we've already begun that kind of transition. Uh, so let's blaze through the history of computing, and I'm not going to talk about this. We'll just kind of uh, we'll, we'll look at it. It's more around the relationship. The thing I wanted you to take away is the relationship between programs, data, and computers. In the beginning, there was a big machine, and we loaded it up with a bunch of data and programs, and we produced more data. We took a function and applied it to some numbers, and we got more numbers. And then we decided that we wanted to do that a lot, and we invented ways of combining these things. And we invented the way of having functions calling each other. Uh, and then we dealt with the fact that some of these functions might be problematic and might clobber other functions. And so we figured out how to create a sane way of sharing uh, programs and sharing data. And then we said, hey, it would be really nice to not have to go to this huge room and uh, interact with this like, huge device all the time. So what if I put a screen in some other room and I run a cable to this big, big room? And that was a great idea. And so a lot of people started doing that. And other people said, hey, what if we make more of these really big room computer things and we distribute them around the planet? And there were a bunch. There were probably around um, 12 in, in one moment. And for you know, a decade or so, there were like basically somewhere between 5 and 12 really big computers that people used. Uh, this was very successful. But then people said, hey, what if we could wire these really big room computer things to each other? And that was the beginning of networking. 
And that uh, created the, the possibility of certain computers being able to call each other and store information and trans transmit it and so on. So we got the beginning of uh, multiprocessing. And the network computers idea was so good that uh, it kind of took the world by storm and it kept expanding. But right around that same time, uh, people created, said, hey, what if this room computer was a lot smaller and we could give it to people and you could take what, have one in your house? And that, at the time, uh, was seen as crazy. Many, 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 many people thought that was a terrible idea. Um, but hey, it uh, happened to be quite popular, and a lot of people did this, and a lot of people did this, and many more people did this, and then suddenly the entire planet was carpeted with computers. Um, uh, but there was a, also a very significant shift when we went from this to plugging all of these computers that people now suddenly had uh, in their homes or in their offices and so on to ha have them work together. So the internet had this, this significant evolution as well. Uh, there are all these different kind of networks, and people said, hey, what if these networks uh, uh, were, were able to talk to each other, and that was the beginning of the internet. Uh, and again, we kind of scaled that up, and now that thing is enormous. Uh, and so, but for the most part, the thing to, to take away from this is that at the end of the day, it's just about some machine computing a function and some data being fed into that function and transmitted over some wires. There's a lot more in the details, but at the core of the, inno the main innovations to computing, it's just better and better ways of moving around functions, better and better ways of moving around data, ways of getting assurances about that data and th those functions and so on. Uh, the web was probably the big moment where all of us got to uh, suddenly experience uh, the internet in full force. That was when suddenly programs were able to display things at us uh, in, in a dynamic medium. Uh, and so at first it was just moving around uh, information. I could change the data, I could send you a link and you could look at it. Um, later on we had these browsers that could run all kinds of uh, more complicated applications. And then we started moving to this world of like, hey, maybe you know, there's like some server out in the, in the, in the um, world somewhere and I'm talking to it and I'm fetching data back and forth and hey, maybe we can ship around these programs as well because after all I have a computer, so why aren't we shipping around programs? Uh, and that's how we got to the web 2.0 world of the dynamic media. Uh, and then we got to a, a similar kind of environment, it's multiprocessing, but now at a massive scale with all kinds of different groups, with all kinds of intentions and all sorts of people uh, caring about different things. Uh, and this was extremely successful, uh, but it created this weird relationship between, between parties where suddenly you, uh, as the user through your client computer, were mostly uh, uh, subservient and in, in, a, uh, in, in a kind of arrangement with a server uh, where the server was mostly controlling your data and the programs and you were mostly accessing that stuff. Uh, and this grew and grew and grew. The, the world uh, got an enormous amount of uh, uh, servers and clients and so on, and you know the Web 2.0 world uh, world exploded, uh, and it left us in a world where suddenly now we have a lot of different machines around the planet. Uh, some of this, them are benign, some of them are malicious, some of them are rational, meaning they'll you know they'll try to cheat you if they can, but they're, they're mostly um, just trying to trying to uh, get away with something. Uh, and then eventually we, we got better improvements. We said, hey, what if we could certify the data and make, make sure the data is actually correct? Um, this is you know, the beginning of things like encryption on the internet and the beginning of the certificate authorities and the beginning of, um, hey, blockchains, uh, suddenly the ability to do computation in this medium. At the end of the day, it's just about data and programs. It's just you're, you have some certified log of data, you're adding functions to it, you're computing on it together. And you know, history is kind of repeating itself. We now have, a, uh, have one blockchain, we have many blockchains, we have like an internet of blockchains. Um, and, the, uh, and the centralized web uh, movement is a similar kind of thing. It said, hey, let's take these links that uh, re refer to data, and what if those were, were secured as well? And again, we, have a, we live in a world with uh, all these kinds of malicious uh, devices and whatnot. Uh, so going back to this, I, I think it's important to, to reflect that uh, you know, in this room right now, there's probably something around you know, two to three computers per person, um, and this number is only going to keep going up, uh, and we'll have new and better ways of accessing the digital medium. We'll have different kinds of interfaces, AR, VR are around the corner. Uh, you know, how many people have like, put on a VR headset at this point? It's a lot. Keep your hand up if you like, had like a wow moment. Yeah, it's like pretty eerie, right? And this is just gonna continue increasing. Uh, how many people have worn an AR like head thing? Yeah, pretty, pretty significant too. That's not quite there yet, but it's getting there. Um, 
brain machine interfaces is another thing that's around the corner that's uh, uh, even even crazier. That's you know a, a bridging moment of going from this thing is displaying pictures at my face, and I'm trying to like type with my finger uh, on it, and like that's a very 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 slow mode of communication. But what happens the moment where like we breach that barrier? That's going to happen sometime in the next I don't know 10 to 20 years. That's probably a, pr a prediction, might be totally off, but that's what it seems like right now. There are other kinds of fundamental changes coming, things like um, machine learning automated and assisted uh, systems, think, think of uh, autonomous cars. Those, I remember when those were crazy, people used to think uh, this was never gonna happen, um, and they're here. Uh, again, raise your hand if you've driven around or been driven by an autonomous car. Yeah, so less people, but just wait. I'm going to keep pulling people year over year, and then you know, suddenly the room will, will be full. Um, and we have robotics, finally. We don't quite have Rosie the robot yet uh, being able to help us, uh, or we don't have like, the, the lost in space robot that can like, befriend you and, and take you and protect you from like, evil aliens and so on. But um, we suddenly now have the first few uh, systems that can actually be somewhat robust to, um, to the environment around them, and that's a very, uh, that's one of those like, things waiting to happen that you know, it looks kind of dumb and looks kind of silly and like, that's never gonna happen, and you know, suddenly uh, the world changes a lot. You know, who remembers when Palm Pilots were around and people kind of laughed at them, right? Like, but now everyone has one of these. Uh, probably one of the most fundamental things that, that shifted um, and, and changed uh, things was the, the, or at least in, in the last few years, uh, one of the most important things that has happened is the development of machine learning systems that can do complex reasoning. Uh, and, and here, complex reasoning at the level of you know, humans uh, in, in certain domains that are extremely, extremely difficult uh, to, to you know, use heuristics for. Uh, so these are things like uh, games like chess and Go and so on. Uh, but my favorite is StarCraft. So um, I think last year, uh, DeepMind, uh, I think you, using a week of training managed to create uh, systems that were able to beat uh, world champions. And, and so this is, this is a degree of, um, of success uh, and, and capability that I don't, think we've, uh, I don't think we fully understand in Grok what this kind of thing is going to be able to do uh, later on. All kinds of systems that can be automated, um, things like traffic con uh, control of all kinds, um, and so on can happen. <clears throat> How many of you are familiar with StarCraft? <clears throat> it's hard, right? Like, you have to maintain an economy, you have to, like, know how to scout, you have to, like, go around, like, uh, counter strategies and all this kind of stuff. Like, that's not, not easy. And, and so that promises very significant changes and improvements to uh, AI machine learning as well. So those are very significant fundamental sh shifts coming. Uh, now, let's, let's think about the internet for a moment as it exists today. Uh, all of, uh, a lot of people in, shown in this slide, or imagine the people in those buildings, uh, are like you and have a lot of devices. Usually one to two right now is kind of the, the average in a lot of these city, cities. Usually people have a smartphone and have a computer. This is very different from 20 years ago, and it's, again, only going to increase. Uh, so think for a moment how much of your life and your personal um, work and relationships and so on are maintained over devices. How much of that uh, depends on the continued operation of the programs that you use day to day and the continued operation of the, um, of the networks. And what kind of properties can malicious actors uh, bring to those, uh, to those systems and completely change or subvert your expectations of, of, of your daily life? Um, the, we are already dependent upon the internet and computing infrastructure in a way that um, makes it extremely uh, uh, both kind of a dangerous attack target, but also an extremely uh, valuable and, and required thing for our daily lives. So imagine if you woke up tomorrow and you couldn't, and like the internet was gone, like completely, like you, you couldn't access any of the data that was on it, or, or um, you couldn't count on it in the same ways that you do today to like find things and so on. Uh, sure, we'll, we would figure things out, life would go on, and we would kind of figure out some other way of doing things, but just think of the differential of going you know, kind of pre-internet to post-internet. Um, this is pretty old, I would like to get an updated plot here, um, but you know, this, this is uh, going to ca catch up very significantly. Over the next few years, we'll see another billion people joining the internet, and that's also gonna come with very significant changes. Uh, it's very interesting to note how the internet differs across the world and how different communities and cities use it. 
of course, there's a lot of security problems, and there are uh, also threats that potentially the internet might split. Uh, so that's something that's coming ahead uh, in kind of in the near term. We don't know whether this is actually going to happen, um, but you know, you know, should absolutely not happen, and we should fight against it. Uh, but this is stuff that uh, different world leaders are considering. Uh, I remember there was a moment when there was the you know, Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace and the hope that at some point uh, the internet could become something like a nation, uh, that the internet was something different from uh, the rest of the world. That idea has somewhat fizzled uh, lately. I, I don't see as many people repeating it, uh, but at, at one point this was a big, um, uh, a, a big thing in the internet communities, and I think it's something that ought to be brought back. We should be thinking of the interconnectedness of humanity as something fundamentally different than nation states. Um, and if we figure out some other ways of coordinating and organizing as humans, then we might be able to have a much brighter and better future uh, than the ones that current uh, government systems have perhaps uh, given or not given, to, given us. I uh, also want to highlight that there's a lot of communities that interact with the internet in very different ways than, than you. Uh, so, for example, one of my favorite, favorite ones is um, in Cuba, there's a thing called El Paquete Semanal, and that's a uh, cache of content that moves in USB uh, drives. Um, and weekly, somebody smuggles a whole bunch of media, like news and video and so on, from somewhere in the US to, uh, to Cuba. Uh, I don't know whether this is still, uh, still a thing, um, but for a while, yeah, it is great. So this is uh, you know, a really important way that a lot of people get news and information from the rest of the world. Uh, and you know, it's a way of interacting with the internet. Uh, it's just over a really, really slow link, so normal programs don't work. Um, but it's still the internet. Uh, you know, things coming up soon are things, um, suddenly we'll have uh, biomedical devices. You know, think of IoT, but suddenly IoT in your, not just in your house, like screwing up everything, but IoT in your body. <laughs> Potentially screwing up everything, right? So, so this is. Uh, I believe now there are there are some devices that either are IoT connected now or will soon be, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but uh, what this this sort of brings in is that these devices that are currently outside um, suddenly may not be in, in in a very near future. We also have hopes that you know the internet will reach uh, other other planets and so on. Uh, so what I want to you know drive to is that. The future is whatever you make it, so you know, hopefully you make it a good one, uh, and this is entirely in your hands. Every single major innovation in computing history has been due to usually, a, you know, starts with a single person or a small group and it grows from there to a large community of people that tr have some transformative change. And so at the end of the day, it's you who is going to be deciding whether or not we have a good future or a bad future, and I hope that you help uh, build a really good one. Uh, so that's the, you know, the main uh, message that I want to bring you is that beyond just IPFS and beyond uh, whatever projects you're, you're currently working on and so on, we're part of something extremely special uh, that is changing how, uh, how humanity operates. And we have not just the ability to influence it uh, for, for good, but we have, I think, a duty uh, and a responsibility to make sure that, it go, that this goes well. Um, I'll, give a brief uh, view into some of the problems that we're thinking about uh, and you know, putting it in context of the things we just discussed. Uh, we tend to think about IPFS problems are, as these. We tend to kind of flash uh, these sets of, sets of problems, things like censorship, the ability to use uh, computing systems offline, making sure that links don't break, uh, improving the security model, dealing with inefficiency problems, uh, and being able to use um, the internet in all kinds of different, um, different networks. And you know, this is kind of like the rating that I give us right now. This is kind of where we're at. Uh, so I would have not sort of predicted this. I wouldn't have thought that censorship was the one that we're kind of doing best at. Um, and, but we have a, lot, a ton of work to do as a, as a whole IPFS community to make sure that I would love to see these things totally green um, in, in some kind of short timeline. Being able to use, imagine being able to use the web and all of its amazing um, systems entirely in a, in a kind of disconnected environment where you can connect to peers uh, nearby and you don't have to go out to the, um, some I, other computer somewhere owned by somebody else uh, to interact with your own personal data. Or imagine being able to have a drastically more efficient system where you don't have to like, keep downloading things from, from somewhere else and you can interact with, with each other here. Uh, so these are some other things that we've been thinking about, Think, things of how to um, kind of model and improve digital freedoms, or potentially how to improve analog freedoms through secure communications. So when you think about a lot of the people that uh, 
today f deal with um, important uh, movements in, against kind of their governments and so on, they face all kind of, of very difficult targeting where you, know, you can think of like the machine learning systems that are tracking everybody's faces in things like the Hong Kong um, movement recently, right? So you remember the Hong Kong like huge march that just happened. <clears throat> there are a bunch of cameras all over the city and uh, taking, taking pictures of people. <clears throat> so people's analog freedoms can't depend on secure communication. So if we can improve these things, then, then the world can be better. There are you know, all sorts of other, other kind of things that derive from this, but this is the headspace and set of uh, problems that we want to work on. Uh, recently, we, we synthesized a roadmap of the things we care about and the things we want to we uh, achieve in the long term, and th they are these sets of, um, uh, th they're kind of broken down and grouped in a set of goals, and we use this as a way to coordinate a larger community to focus on some things together, because if we try to go in every single possible direction at once, we won't move very far, but if we kind of uh, focus a lot of our attention in one area, we can land that and then kind of move on. Uh, that'll, that'll work better. Thank you very much. My, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, so, so one of the things I want to mention as well is, is if, if you think about platforms that you use today, the PC was a really big deal because it was an extremely open platform where you could feed your software into it and, and it could operate. So was the web. The web was this amazing open environment where your creativity and your ability to just make something and give somebody a link um, was a big reason why this thing took off so quickly. Uh, mobile and so on uh, are kind of in between hybrid, where it's sort of open but but kind of closed. All kinds of things are not possible in in a mobile environment the way that it is in, on the web. IoT is mostly closed. Um, some some IoT variants are, are pretty open, uh, but a lot of the systems are, are totally closed down. Uh, and it's unclear what's going to happen with VR and machine learning and so on. Uh, I personally think that uh, we have a, right now an amazing runway of time before kind of the current social media organizations pounce on the VR world. They're already trying to do it. Uh, but it, you know, do you want to have like a metaverse like the web or a metaverse like you know, Facebook? Right? Like that's like the, that's the, the, I think the distinction and the, and the, and the future uh, decision point that we'll have. Uh, so you know, like think of being able to build application systems that, that operate on these. Uh, so some of the stuff that we that I've been you know amazingly proud of the whole community for doing is you know getting the browser upgrade path really close to done. Um, this is something that we focused on early on, early on, and we went from you know having a gateway to having uh, a web UI and then like a desktop system, and then having a whole JavaScript implementation, and then having that work uh, in a browser extension and with all the handlers and having service workers, and so suddenly you know, getting it bundled into some browsers, and so we're, we're right at the cusp of having a you know, much better, better adoption. There's still a long way for all of this to, be, to work perfectly. Uh, there's still a huge gap between kind of work works today and, and, and what, uh, what will, um, what we, the, the level of reliability that we need, uh, but it's, it's pretty great to see this, this level of progress. Uh, on the OS side, we, are, we still have a longer way to go. We have, I think, uh, from the simple systems to now having desktop is a, is a huge uh, improvement, but there's, there's still uh, some road to go. And I think probably the most, uh, mobile is something that we kind of m didn't really focus on as a, as a community, but then there was a few groups that really, really cared about mobile, pushed it to, to where it's at today, and now you, you can actually download mobile apps that come with uh, IPFS bundled in, and you can interact with other peers uh, and so on, which is a really big, really cool result. Um, I'll flash some milestones uh, that we kind of moved uh, through as a community. So, hey, we have content addressed data, and you can link link to it, and you can get it, which is a really big deal. Um, we have we broke apart sections of the project that could be used in other systems without having to rely on like this huge monolith. Uh, instead, we, you can pull out pieces and start reusing them for other components. That's a big result. Um, and you know, there's kind of whole like stack uh, involved in here. Uh, this whole stack and, and so on of systems is used across uh, the DWeb and Web3 ecosystem. Um, again, browser support, OS support. We have dynamic data operating on this stuff with CRDTs, which is really, really awesome. So this is, um, again, a lot of this stuff is prototype stage still, um, but it's, it's great to be able to do kind of real-time uh, connectivity the same way that you could do in something like Google Doc, but with uh, peers uh, around you. Uh, there's kind of the beginnings of, of things like VR, and that's really cool. Uh, and then, of course, I will mention uh, you know, dealing with the censorship problems, things like the distributed Wikipedia mirror, and 
perhaps most importantly here, uh, the fact that IPFS was used in uh, helping distribute the locations of the referendum um, uh, polling booths, right? So if you uh, don't think that governments sometimes uh, prevent uh, freedom of speech, you know, you don't have to go very far uh, to hear from people that uh, were around and were there uh, on those days and had a very you know, problematic situation where their government was preventing them from distributing information, which, is, which kind of sucks. So thank you, all of you, who helped make this, um, you know, we chipped in a little bit, kind of not sort of intentionally, but we, we chipped in a little bit uh, in building some infrastructure uh, that, helped, um, that helped push this uh, towards the future. So thanks for doing that. Um, I, I want to kind of reflect, though, that uh, computing revolutions take a long time. So the history of hypertext is extremely old, uh, as an example. Uh, so the very beginning ideas were in 1945. Uh, there were a whole bunch of sequences of systems all the way until 1991, which was the very first massively distributed hypertext system that really worked. Uh, and that had, had to ride on a whole bunch of other computing innovations. Uh, and I think even Tim Berners-Lee was involved in Enquire, which is not even like the, the the web was kind of like an earlier system. So a whole bunch of ideas got uh, innovated upon all the way. Uh, so you know this kind of stuff is hard, takes time, and the thing that makes it happen in the end is persistence and uh, and and really determination to make sure that certain kinds of results are achieved. So like Tim, you know uh, the battle must rage again. Uh, the, the last thing I'll, I'll mention is. Uh, all of this is entirely about you. you. You as a community, the IPFS community, is the group that is making all of this amazing um, thing happen. Uh, the amazing groups of friendships that were formed through this, the amazing, uh, so this was like the dev meetings that happened recently, so it's a really, really, really fun thing. I can't wait to have the slides, uh, the pictures from uh, this uh, thing uh, for, for the future, so I think it's gonna be a really, really fun time. Uh, and again, thank you to the enormous, amazing community that we have. So give yourself a hand. It's really the, uh, this was a picture that I used at the very beginning. So thanks for joining the fellowship of YPFS. Uh, and let's, let's have some fun.